All right, I think we're good. This is as long as the leashes they give me anymore. They, they cut me off every year. They give me less and less. Um, howdy, thanks for showing up. Uh, I'm not sure what talk you're here to see, but it's not mine. Um, <laughs> My name is Bruce Potter. I'm going to be talking about the dirty secrets of the security industry. There's a secondary microphone here. What's this, sir? Just a recorder. Who are you? Your PC world. Excellent. I love press. Last year, the press quoted me as saying an expletive and my employer's name in the same sentence. Uh, <laughs> I hadn't even landed on the ground yet in my hometown, and I had a nasty grant from our PR department saying, we've had better pull quotes than this. <laughs> Fair enough, God damn it. Um, so I would I request Mr. PC World and anyone else, if I, if I do happen to let an expletive go, don't quote me on it. Fill it in with something colorful, ponies, rainbows, I don't care. Um, just anything else. So. Um, so Priest has taken up a few seconds of my time, so I'll get right to the chase. Um, first thing I want to say, this has nothing to do with my talk, but in general, you're at a security convention. Do you trust the wireless network here? No, right, okay. Do you, do you trust the hotel billing system after watching Major Malfunction own people's uh, you know, TV sets in the last few years? No. Should you trust the jackass that's up on stage talking? No, right, okay, first and foremost, talking, writing articles, writing books is all exercise in social engineering, okay, full stop. I can write something that convinces people that I know what the hell I'm talking about, and then they give me a microphone. I could come up here and moon you all for an hour, and they have no control over it at this point, you know, it's like it's all over. Um, the first book I wrote uh, was a wireless security book for O'Reilly and um, like literally I just got a wild hair one day, I sent out a, a proposal to them and like two weeks later they sent me a contract to sign, you know, and there might have been like five email exchanges in between and that was it. You know, I, I like O'Reilly, they're, they're a good publisher, I certainly enjoy w working for them, but um, you know, it, there was not a lot of due diligence involved. You know, and for people coming up on stage, they're spewing stuff that you take as gospel, you go back to your employers and your friends, you tell them all about it, it may not be true. So challenge everything that you hear when you're here at DEF CON, not just what's the MAC address of the AP, but what did this guy just say about attacking MQ series, or this guy say about attacking Cisco routers, okay? Um, by day, uh, full disclosure, uh, I am a security consultant for Booz Allen Hamilton in the greater uh, Baltimore area. Uh, by night, I founded the Shmoo Group, and that's enough about me. So, <clears throat> what's the goal of this thing? I'm going to poke people in the eye today. That's kind of my intent. Um, there have been various um, attempts at, at kind of stabbing the security industry in the face over the last few years at DEF CON, and I'm going to make another run at it. Uh, there are 800-pound gorillas in the room today and they might be blocking a fire exit. Um, so if you ask them to leave, that would be helpful. Um, but honestly, there's a lot of things going on in the security industry today that we may not be consciously thinking about, right? There's a lot of issues, there's a lot of new things that have happened in the last eight, nine, 10 years. This is DEF CON 15, right? DEF CON 4 still involves, or DEF CON 5 still involves scavenger hunts where people were stealing shit, right? <laughs> I mean, like, to be successful in the scavenger hunt, you had to go steal stuff. That, that doesn't fly so well today, you know? Like, we, we are much more calm than we used to be. DEF CONs in years past were pretty crazy. But everyone's, oh, it's DEF CON. It's like it hasn't changed. It's like the security industry. Oh, it's the security industry. It hasn't changed. What's changed between, uh, you know, 1997 and today, I mean, it, it's immeasurable. And so let's, let's be honest, let's address that, and that's what I'm gonna try to do today. Um, there's a lot of people in here that work for companies that I might kind of poke and say things about. This is all, again, this is my opinion. All right. I mean, you know, ill will. I know a lot of us are working hard to solve the good, good uh, problems and things like that. I just want to get some discussion going. If you have questions, if you have concerns, ask now. Throw stuff, preferably very expensive digital cameras. Um, give me some warning so I can catch them, um, and uh, scrape the serial numbers off. So. Um, but feel free, and again, we'll break this out somewhere else. And there's bars here in Vegas, I hear, and we can take it up later there too as well. So, so first things first. Uh, I'm using Keynote now instead of PowerPoint. You might notice the little spinny animations. Keynote users, I heard a few of yay, Max rule. Um, <laughs> except for everyone that's got an iPhone and turned off Wi-Fi the moment they came to DEF CON. Uh, so this is really awkward to have like one screen like way the hell. Normally I'm like in front of it pounding on it and I can't reach it. So um, I draw this pyramid a lot and I think a number of you have probably seen it already. This is, I, I, I can, here, this is my shirt. So I'm dancing for you. This is the pyramid. All right. 
And like right here at the bottom, I'm doing this for the folks over here that can't see anything, um, is operational stuff, operational IT. The idea here, this pyramid is like Maslow's Pyramid of Human Needs except geared toward security operations, right? You need to do certain things first in order to do the next thing. Like I need to have food, water, and shelter before I care about is it Hillary or Obama, right? Like before I get way up the food chain dealing with politics, I have to have basic things taken care of. Same goes in the data center, folks, right? It's all about keeping live systems secure and running. That's what security is, okay? Not naval contemplation, not feeding all our goddamn wallets. It's about keeping things secure. And we need to have some structure how we think about this. This is a structure that I use. Again, you can disagree. At the bottom, IT operations. You gotta do that right, or security doesn't matter, right? If you have the dumbest sysadmins in the world and the smartest security guys, doesn't matter, you're screwed, right? Um, so we got patch management, policies and procedures, things like that. You do that right, you move up the food chain, okay? You start talking about firewalls, AAA services, bread and butter network security, right? This is what we all know network security to be. Farther up the food chain, start getting a little bit more sophisticated. Have things like software security, actually reviewing the custom code that we develop, okay? There's another really interesting piece of software security that can be deployed in an operational construct that people don't spend a lot of time doing right now. Um, and it's something that I really think that we need to, need to address a little bit better. And it's the idea of, of providing software level access control. This is not world, group, user, read, write, execute privileges. That's not fine-grained access control. That's access control for 1972, and that's cool. I mean, it was cool back when they were making Pintos, but it kind of sucks right now, kind of like Pintos do today. Um, so, uh, products like SE Linux, okay, that is the, uh, uh, SE Linux is the equivalent of taking a strategic bomber to go get the groceries, right? Like, it's hella fast, and it carries a hell of a lot of groceries, but it's a little awkward to take off and land, you know? <laughs> I don't know about your safe way, but I can't land my B2 at mine very effectively. Um, there are lighter weight products, like uh, AppArmor from uh, Novell, that allow you to, on an application by application basis, say what the application is allowed to do and not allowed to do. It's allowed to get to this directory, write this file, read this file, do all these things. Hey, what's fantastic about that is if you have software that's written badly, and someone goes in and tries to pop your box through that software, those types of systems will protect the box. The application may die, that's cool, but your the rest of the system, the rest of your data will be protected. This doesn't require the developer to do anything different, it just requires that you understand the product and you deploy it in an operational environment. Neat stuff, not a lot of people do it because they like to jump up to the next level, right? IDS, okay? We've done, we're, we're done with stopping attacks and now we're gonna just contemplate them, okay? I got an IDS, woo, look at that. Did you see what that guy did to our network yesterday? Wow. <laughs> Meanwhile, your application server has been owned by like 15 different people, but it was really cute how they did it. Um, that's not acceptable, right? You need to be focusing what's going on in the software before you care about IDS. And then finally, if you're really out there, you can deal with honeypots, but that's only if like you're an academic or you've done everything else so well and you still have gobs of money. So um, what gave birth to these gorillas that we're gonna discuss? Um, this is like the four minute history of the tubes, okay? So let's just, just bear with, that was Ted Stevens thing, right? Call it the tubes. I, w I spent nine, nine years in Alaska and I saw that many, his offices got raided the other day. That was the greatest thing ever. <laughs> he's the longest running senator ever. It's like 40 years. And someone's like, oh, do you think he did something wrong? I'm like, he's 40 years in the Senate. By definition, he's done something wrong. Like you cannot <laughs> possibly be in the Senate that long and not have committed a crime. Um, so in the 60s, computer security, Right, those are the guys at the doors that checked your badges and had guns, okay? That was computer security in the 60s. There were some academic discussions of, you know, how to secure these computer things, but it wasn't really a field yet, right? We were still dealing with building the computers. There was no commodity shops in Taiwan that would supply you with gigabytes of RAM on a second by second basis. I mean, this was tubes. Um, and we're all kind of bent with this thing, like I'm falling off the side there for some reason, but it says tubes over there in the corner for those that can't read. Um, Things got a little bit more serious in the 70s. Telnet was introduced, okay? Telnet was actually kind of a groundbreaking thing when it came out. It allowed people just to connect to other people's computers very easily and do stuff, which was pretty cool. It made networks actually very functional. Um, in the mid-70s, there's a lot of research done into trusted computing systems, uh, which kind of today the lineage is now the trusted computing platform and things of that nature. All that genesis was back in the late 60s and early 70s. We also had neat things like blue boxing. Captain Crunch blew the whistle. Blue boxes came out, 
telephone freaking had its start in the early 70s, okay? That little green bar in the bottom that can, people in like the front row and a half can see, that's the, my estimated amount of revenue in the entire computer security field in the, you know, throughout the 70s. This is based on wild conjecture and a logarithmic scale. So um, <laughs> feel free to disagree. Um, in the 80s, BBS is, man, it's all about dial-up, right? Like, check out my mad uh, 2400 baud modem. Like, wow, that's so much faster than my 300 baud acoustic coupler. Um, <laughs> virus and Trojans went mainstream. Like, you know, I remember as a kid, I had, like, this drawer full of floppy drives and, like, all these Apple II programs, and they're probably all riddled with viruses, too, you know? Like, it was just, you popped in a drive into somebody, or floppy into somebody's box, and, like, it got owned. Cool. Um, like, if it was only that easy today. Oh, wait, maybe it is. Um, the hacker underground was born in earnest. 2600, the hacker quarterly emerged. Legion of Doom, CDC, all these groups have their roots in the 80s, okay? Old school hacking. Man, that was, that was it. The PC was born, and the Morris worm, right? The big, you know, what do they, what do they call that, the tipping point? Um, that was the big tipping point, right? Like, holy crap, we can write malicious software that will just run around and take down the entire, quote, internet at the time. Man, that's, that's nasty stuff. And now we see this green bar, hey, there's some more money in securing our systems. Well, in, in the 90s, there was a lot more money, right? VCs lost all sense of reality and gave money to anyone, okay? Just poof, if you, if you had a pulse and you said computer security, you could get a couple million dollars to go off and do something. Uh, usually burn it in a fire pit in your backyard. Um, firewalls, antivirus, IDS, rapidly emerged and became commonplace, right? Stateful firewalls came out in 1994. By 1996, you know, there's all these companies, Checkpoint, whoever else, that have state, stateful firewalls for sale. 97, everyone's got them deployed. Like, that time between stateless packet filtering and stateful firewalls, you know, it's like literally like three or four years, poof, and everyone had stateful firewalls. So just to be clear, we all understood firewalls as well as we needed to in 1997, all right? There's no more interest at that point, right? Like, we should be done. We understand the purpose of firewalls. Just file that one away for later. Um, the interweb was born, and we lost 65,000 ports, right? <laughs> it, it was port 80 and 443. To this day, that's what most people think the internet is. And MySpace has its own port now. Um, so it's so, so much goddamn traffic, they assigned it 80 point shit. Um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, hackers went mainstream, right? DEF CON got explosively large, all this hacker mentality thing. Everybody that could stand up a website and spell leet became a hacker group, right? The Shrew Group was founded in 1999. That was about our level of understanding at the time was, you know, hey, cool, we, we know how to install FreeBSD. Uh, hackers the movie, the pinnacle of hacker culture. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, anyway, all those that said woo-hoo, I have a special, um, never mind. Um, so, and then, and then the naughties. Uh, that was a great name for this decade that we're in that didn't seem to catch on, you know, back in aught eight or whatever. Um, and people should, I think, call it the naughties. I'm just going to take this decade and call it that. Um, the internet went everywhere, right? Like, it didn't go to our toasters, but it sure as hell went to our iPhones. Um, and it went everywhere else. And so it's pervaded everything that we do. Um, note the green bar. The information security industry keeps getting larger, right? More systems, more networks, bigger IT budgets, more money, period. How many people here went to Black Hat? More money, all right? So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of this. Hackers became profit-driven, right? And there's two ways to view this. Hackers became profit-driven and went underground or making good money working organized crime and things like that. Hackers were profit-driven and went above ground and got consulting jobs. Right? It's kind of a joke and it's kind of true. Um, we also, it's funny, we've reproduced. So if you go to Jinx Hackware and you try to buy like onesies with little cute hacker slogans, they're out, right? <laughs> because they sell out because we've all had kids. Oh. <laughs> Tucking the Jinx bag under your seat right now, aren't you? Um, so anyway, Microsoft found security this decade. This is probably going to be a turning point in computer security, okay? What Microsoft has been doing, I'm not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong, but it's changing the rules of the game, and we need to understand it. Slammer Code Red, Die Hard 4, 
which apparently was actually a pretty good portrayal of like computer attack and hacker, you know, kind of thing. So uh, that was my counterpoint to the the hackers of the movie crap. Um, more tubes. So secret number one. That was all just set up to get to the secrets, right? Secret number one: defense in depth, dead. It's dead. It never should have started in the first place. Let's just put it that way. This mantra that we live and breathe of layer on, layer after layer after layer of security is totally broken at its foundation, right? It is an operational response. I need to secure the systems in my data center, and the code sucks. What do I do? I buy firewalls, antivirus, all this stuff. That's the response. The response, how to make that better, isn't build better firewalls and antivirus and anti-spam software and all that, it's to fix the code, okay? So the first thing that we had is we had computers, okay? We were happy that they did our bidding and didn't take over the world, all right? <laughs> this is a good thing. They had vacuum tubes, they were fragile. You could smack them and they stopped running. Um, there was no type safety, there was no fault isolation, no air handling, no sense of assurance, but again, it didn't matter because they could count to 10, all right? The, the artificial intelligence war, and I've said this before, we thought AI was gonna be solved in the 60s and by now the computers would be running this conference for us because it was all about symbolic computing. We would build more complicated processors that thought like human beings and that's how we would build artificially intelligent systems. Turned out that didn't work so well, right? What, what killed AI? What was the final victory in AI? MIPS, raw horsepower, okay? You put a lot of information on disk, you process it as fast as humanly possible, and suddenly you're deterministic at checkers, right? <laughs> Seriously, like we just beat checkers. Some guys up in, up in Canada, I think it was, I don't know how many people saw this, but they beat checkers. Like, holy crap. Now, the way that they beat it, it wasn't deterministic. They didn't start from the beginning. They can't quite capture the entire space of a checkers game, but they work backwards from every possible finishing position, and then they go 10 steps backwards from there. So as long as you get to the point where you've removed four pieces from the board, the computer wins, full stop. Moore's Law says in a couple years, they'll be only have to remove three pieces. A couple more years, we'll remove two. A couple more years, we'll actually have solved checkers, okay? Wasn't symbolic computing, wasn't pretty, you know, ways of thinking about it. It was raw horsepower. The vacuum tubes didn't have raw horsepower, but they were awful, awful cute. So, over time, we hooked these things together, okay? Remember back to my fancy timeline? For those that have seen me talk before, this is clearly a quantum leap forward in my PowerPoint presentation skills. Uh, some nods. <laughs> Before it was just drunken, like I had transparencies from the bar and I had just written on the bar napkin. <laughs> um, we hooked things together. The ARPANET begot internet, begot, you know, MySpace. Um, firewalls popped up everywhere. TIS released its source, stateful firewalls, all this stuff. Still had the bad code, right? A better firewall didn't fix everything else. Didn't make my mail server better. Mail server needs to be reachable from the entire internet. Firewall, useless, right? Full stop. Well, if you're not running other ports on your firewall or on your mail server, your firewall doesn't really have to do anything. It doesn't do anything the box couldn't do natively itself, assuming its IP stack doesn't suck, right? And IP stacks have, have been around for a long time, and we're generally getting better at making good ones. Although Microsoft, in a bit of a you know way back machine thing a couple uh, years ago, in XP re-released, I guess it was the land attack. Like, it was like in the release notes, like re-enabled land. Um, and if you sent something like from itself to itself, from the same port to the same destination port, the box would be SOD. It's like, cool, that was 1995 you did that, and you brought it back in 2005. Um, but in general, you know, our IP stacks have gotten better. Uh, Steve Bellavin has this fantastic quote, and it can pretty much serve as the foundation of how you think about security, right? A firewall is a network response to a software engineering problem. Okay, got bad code, didn't know what to do, bandaged it at the firewall. That's the defense and death mantra, right? Got bad code, put on antivirus. Got bad code, put on AAA services. Did all this crap. Dawn of the firewalls was the beginning of the age of defense and death. So, um, networks became global, right? We deployed IDSs and antivirus because we couldn't keep a handle on the bad code anymore. We got more complicated with our security product offering. More and more money got infused to the system. We deployed multi-factor authentication and we spent a ton of time managing this, right? We pay security people to manage firewalls, to manage antivirus, to do all this stuff. It costs a lot of money. 
We don't pay security people to manage bad code, right? We don't pay them to work with the developers and work with our vendors to make better code. We pay them to manage the band-aids for the crappy code that was created in the first place, okay? I'm not here to say, hey, we need to change the software development model and push liabilities in the vendor and whatever. I know Bruce Schneier and some other folks have some views about how to do that. I don't know how to fix that from a policy and whatever perspective. From a technology perspective, though, we need to, I've got some ideas and they'll come in a minute, but anyway. Um, I hate it when I trail off in the slide and I forget where I was and I start referencing random things and waving my hands hoping you'll just forget about me for a few seconds and wonder like what are you going to do for dinner and whatever and then I'll say something funny and you'll check back in and then we'll just keep on going. Um, so, so still we have bad code. Um, so now we're moving toward the network is a computer, right? Um, Scott McNeely, CEO of Sun said the network was the computer. He was right. He was wrong in two regards. One, he was about a decade too early, and two, he worked for Sun. Um, so he was hoping the network would be the Sun computer, but it turns out, no, it's a Wintel platform. Sorry there, guy. Um, SOA, we're going to the service-oriented everything. We don't understand it. Don't have a clue. Like I read all these you know, CXO level magazines and whatever and they talk about SOA revolutionized our data center. Like all it did was hide it on the map so you couldn't find it anymore. You went to McDonald's and thought, this is a really nice data center. It's got a fryer. Um, <laughs> we don't understand XML security. We don't understand these incredibly distributed systems with all these services running. We can't write line by line secure code, right? How on God's earth can we expect to plug all these systems together in anything that resembles a secure fashion? With no clue. We don't understand the theory behind it. We understand the theory of line-by-line -line secure code now. We just don't necessarily know how to enforce it yet. When it comes to this big service-oriented hoo-ha that we developed, we don't get that at all. And in between all those little components, we've layered in lots of defense and depth. All these little dots and starbursts and other things that aren't rendering because it's too damn small. Um, we, don't, we have to manage all that, and we have to continue to adapt it. Uh, XML firewall, that's, that's great, because it sounds like it ties into software problem and the network thing. And all, you, you might parse it for like you know proper structure and things like that, but you're not going to prevent really sophisticated attacks. You're not going to prevent bad things from happening. You might get the ankle biters like you got with your firewall, but you're not going to get anything serious. Um, so millions and millions of lines of code went into me writing this crappy presentation, right? There's billions of KLOC in any enterprise, okay? Billions of lines of code running all the networks and systems that we use every day to drive around Las Vegas, to fly home, to order pizza, whatever. Billions of lines of code, we don't understand any of it. So, have we seen more security uh, staff applied to this problem? Have we seen you know, better management tools and whatever? Yeah, we've seen all kinds of advances there, but we still haven't fixed the code. Note expletive on the slide, PC world guy, if you could not include the expletive. Um, type safety. You know, there were people, Gary McGraw, um, he wrote a really interesting book, uh, Exploiting Software, and in the, in the beginning there's a chapter of the kind of staring into this crystal ball and say, what's, what's software security going to look like in the next 10 years? And it's actually, it was written like three or four years ago, and it was pretty well on track already. But one of the things that Gary, um, I think it was Greg Hogland wrote with him, um, said is, in 10 years we'll be using all languages that are type safe. And a lot of these kind of low-level buffer overflow problems that we have are going to go away. I thought that was really, really um, aggressive. I don't think that we're going to get rid of C anytime soon. How many kids just graduated college in this room in the last two years? Wow, this is an older DEF CON crowd, I guess. <laughs> Did you still learn C, sir? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Do you know what type safety is, sir? Okay, good, good. So the CS programs are getting a little bit better. Um, Trust in computing, things of this nature. We need to push vendors. We need to push operating system providers, software providers, hardware providers. We want better code. Because ideally, what I want to do to my IT security line item budget is delete it, right? I don't want firewalls. I don't want IDSs. I don't want any of that, OK? I want the software that my developers write and that my vendors provide to not suck. Full stop. You know, it's not, it's not a big request. It's just a humble one that I don't want their code to be so bad that I have to spend millions of dollars to protect myself from their ineptitude, right? Why do we allow defense in depth to be written up in academic textbooks, to be preached from on stage at conferences, and be discussed in the halls as, as if it's legitimate? It is not a legitimate or rational way of thinking about the problem. 
okay? Defense in depth is silly. We put our heads in the sand and we believe that if we buy these products, we're more secure. And it's total and complete bullshit. Whew. All right. That was fun. I thought I might get an applause out of that or a hallelujah or something, but I think I just scared the hell. Next. Tell us what you want us to do. Okay. It, the, the, the request was next time I want a round of applause, I'll ask. Uh, I also request that everyone, uh, there was actually a, a fee for attending this talk. So if you come up afterwards and give me, I don't know, 50 bucks, 100, whatever your heart feels is proper. Is that, is that a good, will that work too, sir? Whoever said that? Make the shopping cart go negative. Cart go negative. <laughs> All right. So secret number two. We are a long way away from making our jobs professional. Right? We write security professional in our blogs and all that kind of crap. Well, we're not. Well, a few of us might be by the you know, proper definition, but not, not many. Um, how many people have a degree in something that resembles computer security? How many people have it? Okay, of all those people, keep your hands up. How many of those are in information assurance? Right, okay, that's at least 50% of the folks in this room, right? 50% uh, of the six people that raised their hands. Um, was a master levels program, sir? Yeah, masters, masters. Anyone have an undergraduate degree in something that says computer security? All right. Oh, we got one. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Even if you were lying, just to prove my point. Um, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> he titled it himself. Excellent. I'm going to be the supreme overlord of all things electronic. <laughs> I have a doctorate. They said no to that. Yeah. My mentor disagreed. He already had that title. Um, so what are we doing here, right? This is a tens of billions of dollar industry. We are the leaders in this industry. None of us are formally trained in this job. We're all faking it. We're posers. <laughs> There is no barrier to entry into security, right? We are protecting the world's financial institutions, airlines, military installations. I just walked up and said I could do it, and they gave me a job. <laughs> yeah, we're damn good at lying to people, as it turns out. So, what, what you know... Oh my God, name another industry that's not, that, that is a skilled, quote, industry that has the same situation. Politics. <laughs> I said skilled, sir. Skilled. <laughs> yeah, we, we're a socially adept, uh, kind of. Um, except for after three o'clock when we get to the bar. Um, so, the question remains, we, we probably do want to formalize our body of knowledge, right? Like, you know, this whole defense in depth, is it good, is it bad? You know, that's like a little sliver of the holy war that is computer security. And we've got a bunch of young kids coming through school. They're just owning stuff because that's what they like to do. It'd be cool if we had a framework in which to get them educated. And we agreed, or at least had a process to start agreeing on what the way to do things was. You know, we don't, we don't, we can't agree in this room. We can't agree to write textbooks. We can't agree to train people. What do we do? How do we codify our knowledge to build the next generation of mini Kaminsky's? <laughs> I want an army of mini Kaminsky's just so I can like punt them. Poof. Uh, is Dan here? No, of course not. Um, mini hall of ours, mini DTs. You know, how do we take the knowledge that we have, make it formal, and not make it the CISP? Um, I mean, that's a few, a few giggles. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Um, so I work for a large uh, consulting company where there's a lot of CISPs, so I'm just going to duck. Um, software developers are the smartest they're ever going to be the day they graduate from college. Sorry. Developers in the room, it's the truth. Get used to it. it you're going downhill. Um, you learn about all these formal processes and how memory mapping works and C, C, uh, when you're in college. When you get out of college, you learn new languages. You learn how to, software engineering really works in the field, which is, turns out, quality's not important, making it through QA is, right? They're two discrete things. You understand what QA is going to test, and you write around it, you know? You, you don't actually make good software, you just make adaptive software that makes the QA guys happy. Um, and you do it on time. So you can get out of work at a normal hour, and you do it on budget because you like getting paid. Um, so 
That's the way software engineering works. We don't teach kids coming out of school how to write secure code. There's a few programs around the world that do, but it's not yet commonplace. You know, you don't pick up a compiler on day one and write hello world in a way that's resilient to attack, right? <laughs> Most of the time, like, you write hello world, and then you write something that takes input and then displays it to the screen. Like, and, and that program is totally ownable, right? It's just like, get S, blah, pop. Oh, hey, look, I popped the machine. Um, it would be cool if, like, after hello world, the next step was, here's how to write, you know, a get S thing that actually is secure and start from day one. I learned when I, I dropped out of college um, that... In my computer science course, they taught us exception handling and things like that as like a third year CS problem. I'd already developed all my bad habits by then. I commented my code. I commented out the crap that didn't work and rewrote it again underneath it. And I kept doing this and I would have like 100K chunks of code with only like six compiled lines. So <laughs> someone at some point should have said, don't do that, right? But they don't. We don't teach people how to write good code because we don't know how to because there's no formal body of knowledge and we're not professionals yet. So this is something, I don't, I don't have a solution for this. You know, this is one of those things, security is everybody's problem, right? Well, sure, right, whatever. Like, that's, that's a fantastic idea. It's, you know why it's everybody's problem? Because we don't know how to solve it for them. So we, oh, it's your problem to deal with, right? Like, that's why security is there. You see these signs, like, in the office building, oh, security is everyone's problem. No, it's, it's your problem, as it turns out. You just don't know how to do it. Um, we can't train everyone who has the word security in their title, let alone train all the users, right? Like, it's, it's hard to get the money to come to Black Hat and DEF CON, and most of you are just here to drink. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being honest, sir. I appreciate it. It is Las Vegas, if you hadn't noticed. Um, I don't know how anyone gets away. This is the boondoggle of all boondoggles. You get 7,000 people, you know most of them, and you go to Vegas, and you drink, and you call the security conference, and your employer pays for it. I'm sorry. They might be listening. Don't quote him on that. Yeah, don't go. <laughs> Hi. What we need. Yeah, rewind it. Well, I'll auction it off later. Um, <laughs> users... Users need tools that they can't screw up, right? They need shotguns that don't have triggers and have solid barrels. Because then they can aim it at their foot all day long and do this, and nothing goes wrong. Like, it's fantastic. We need to build software systems that enable the users to be as dumb as humanly possible and still maintain the integrity of our systems. Okay? Doesn't mean we should install a better VPN so that all their bit, the crappy data is encrypted. No, we should write better systems. How do we do that? We have to train people to be how to write it. How do we train them? We don't have a clue. Okay? So there's some government initiatives to try to get people smarter. There's some private sector initiatives. There's a lot of money being spent on this problem. But we're years and years and years away from making it better. Okay? Let's not kid ourselves. I, and I know this is a holy war, like you read full disclosure and other lists and, you know, damn the security professional, you guys are all a bunch of white hat losers, blah, blah, blah. Fine. Well, I can embrace that attitude, right? Like, this is something I didn't include here, I don't think. But think about the hacker culture 10 years ago and think about it today. And what I like to say is, if we had started ShmooCon in 1997, our main web server would have been owned off the face of the earth the moment we opened that conference for being a bunch of white hat lamers. Right? And it would have been socially acceptable. Like, that's just the way the community worked. Like, there was a battle there about white hats and black hats and gray hats and all this crap, and people owned other people's boxes, and it was all commonly accepted. The chaos was part of the culture. It is no longer part of all culture. This is the most polite group of people. There were people, no offense, standing in line yesterday to buy T-shirts at like 3 o'clock on Thursday afternoon at DEF CON. Does that strike anyone as a little strange? Like, this thing is all about damn the man. Like, someone should have walked up with, like, I work at jinxhackware.com t-shirt, walked behind the damn counter, and bought themselves a t-shirt and walked away. Like, that would have gotten mad props. But no, we all stand in line. We're very polite. We're the British and the French having a battle in the 1700s. We all stand <laughs> on two sides. No, way. I'm going to shoot now, and then you should... Bam! One, two, three. All right, all right, you lost ten guys. All right, we'll stand here. I'll make myself real big. All right, you missed me. All right, guys, come on, let's do it again. You know, our adversaries are the American revolutionaries, right? They're crawling around in the woods, and they're doing things that we can't do, or at least we can't think we can do, 
right? Because we're in this thing. We all come in, priest says, get the hell out of the aisles, and we do. And I'm not trying to disparage the whole, like, not pissing off the fire marshal, because God knows we don't want to piss off the fire marshal. Um, that appears to be like a completely unregulated branch of the government. There's like the executive, the legislative, the judicial, and then the fire marshal. Like, <laughs> he shut down everything. But I remember the first year that we had problems here with the fire marshal, and I was the first talk on the first day in one of the tracks, and one of the goons came up and said, um, you've got to tell everyone to, that's not sitting down to clear out. I'm like, I'm not telling anybody shit. Like, <laughs> you tell them, guy. That's not my job. I don't want to get killed. But everyone left. You know, everyone got up and, and politely left. We need to kind of embrace the fact, like, okay, if we're going to kind of ride this line of gray hat and professional, like, let, make a decision, right? Be a professional. Let's figure out how to professionalize the workforce. Let's make the cert certifications worthwhile. Let's make the education worthwhile. Let's make the training worthwhile. Let's find a way to pass this on to the next generation and do things that don't matter. I'm getting the 10-minute sign. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> All right, so, woo! Defense in depth led to this ginormous green industry that I'd written. Um, very few products are actually geared toward making things more secure, right? Like, I, I think I might have said this. There are some products, software scanners, um, you know, Ounce Labs, Fortify Aspect, to name a few, that, that actually are geared toward helping at least audit code, right? And then you've got hardware security modules and smart cards and things that are probably part of secure systems. But a lot of what we buy is part of this defense in depth. And that's the big part of most IT security budgets, right, is what we would classify as defense in depth network security hoo-ha. So... Let's look at a recent kind of, I call this case study like it's formal. It's a bunch of random bullet points pulled from a couple of different articles. So um, Microsoft, Microsoft went to the river and they found security, right? Hallelujah, they got it. They figured it out. They spent a lot of money. Right or wrong, what they're doing, their approach, they are spending more money than most companies spend, period, uh, on security. And they heard it. You know, vendors, consumers, all these people said, we need more secure systems. Okay. Microsoft said, all right, well, we're right in Vista. What can we do in Vista? And they've got all this stuff, and they'll tell you all about it in a million briefings about how this is so cool. One of the neat things was on 64-bit version of the OS, their flagship product geared toward industry, where all their new applications and things are going, they said, what we're going to do is require all drivers to be signed. Simple. Right? This is good. If you've ever seen, like I did a talk on trusted computing and talk about a little bit about driver signing and the good that can yield. It doesn't mean it's good code, but it means it's the code you intended to run. Okay, think about if on your laptop or your computer or your iPhone or whatever today, when you're at DEF CON, every time you touch the keyboard, you could verify only the code that you intend to run is running. Hallelujah. Like that would be fantastic to know there's no Trojans, there's no, there's no viruses that have been loaded, no keystroke loggers, that kind of thing, which tend to work by basically acting as a driver and hooking the kernel. Okay, so Microsoft said, well, sorry, going to have to get all your, your drivers signed. Well, and they closed off a bunch of APIs that the security vendors were using to do their stuff, all the antivirus and whatever. Security community, security, excuse me, product community, got very upset. It said Microsoft's exerting too much pressure, right? They're locking us out of the space. Because not only are they doing this, but at the same time, they're releasing a competing antivirus and anti-phishing product. Maybe they overstepped some antitrust bounds there a notch. Um, but nonetheless, they've made an effort to honestly lock down the operating system, right? And a pretty good one. I think that most of us can common sense say, yeah, that, that sounds pretty reasonable. Well, the security product vendor said it's not reasonable to us because it impedes our ability to sell our products. Okay, so then they start bickering. Some of these security vendors, um, Authentium for once is the one I could find, found ways to bypass the security mechanism that Microsoft had created and actually geared their flagship product around that bypass. So they had to hack Vista to make the product work, then they released a press release that said, hey, we figured out how to hack Vista so we get our security product to work right. <laughs> Excellent, that's what I want to hear. Like, as a consumer of security products, I want to hear that you had to pop the box in order to unpop the box. Um, so Microsoft said, all right, we hear you. We don't want to get sued. Antitrust lawyers are really expensive, so uh, we'll open up some APIs. We'll allow some unsigned interaction and basically defeat the whole purpose of what we were trying to do in the first place. All right? So let's think about that. In the past, we presumed that... Our systems were so insecure that we had to buy third-party security products to make them better, right? That's the presumption, period. That's the ground truth of why we buy third-party security products, not because they have pretty boxes. Um, the corollary to that is we believe the third-party security products code was of a higher quality 
than the code that it was trying to protect. <laughs> giggle, giggle, chuckle, yeah, okay. There, there's some examples where that might not have been true. Um, the future says, hey, security is a real concern, and big software shops are actually starting to do the right thing. The corollary to that is, so are we going to keep spending money on security products? Or at least the same type of security products? Or is the security product space going to fundamentally change in the next five years? Ten. I'm usually kind of aggressive on that. Um, what does the future look like? I don't have any idea. Okay, I'm just trying to set the hook for you guys to think about it. Because um, I know at some point a goon's going to come up here and huck something at me to get me off stage. Um, secret the last. Full disclosure is dead. Let's not kid ourselves, right? There's money in disclosing vulnerabilities. There's a lot of money in it. And it's changing the landscape of computers. E5? All right, thanks. Uh, damn it. Over the last 15 years, really, is when the disclosure discussion started, right? We, we're a community, okay? We're not a, prof group, a professional group. There's no DEF CON professional engineer badge that you get or something like that, right? I mean, we are an ad hoc community that has, has grown and lived on the sharing of information publicly. And we can do so in a way to exert pressure on vendors to fix their software and their hardware. Right? That's the nature of full disclosure. And there's an entire spectrum of how to disclose the RF policy and the OI safety guide and all these different private views about how to deal with disclosure. Okay? So responsible disclosure was, we used to have disclosure panels at DEF CON where people debated the gradient of full disclosure. Well, now things have changed. Skip the stuff in the top. In the bottom, um, we have companies that will pay. We have very legitimate companies that will pay for vulnerability information. And there's some not so legitimate companies that may be paying for vulnerability information as well. They're private transactions. It seems totally acceptable to at least the majority of the community that that's OK. It's OK to find a vulnerability in a system, not tell the vendor, to tell a third party instead, get money from them, and expect that they're going to do the right thing. OK? I'm not. I got nothing against ZDI and VCP. Okay, I'm just using them as an example here. So, Cisco and Microsoft won't pay. They're taking a stand, right? The the problem is so yeah. So then, you know, well, should the vendors pay? Well, is that extortion? I don't know. Well, yeah. found. You know, and, and applying that kind of pressure, it might be a good thing. I'm not, I don't want to take a stand on this, largely because I don't have time to get, get into the discussion right now. But um, maybe they will. I, it's funny, because I, I remember, take an example. I used to do some uh, free wireless stuff in Northern Virginia. This guy came up to me. I, I got this a couple of times. And they say, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm thinking about getting into the wireless security consulting business. And my, this company that's down the road, I was war driving. And I found a bunch of open things that they had. And their file server's open and whatever. So I was going to go down and tell them if they pay me $10,000, I'll fix it. I'm like, that, that sounds like extortion, you know? <laughs> like. But it turns out that that's the market that we're creating today to sell vulnerabilities in. So, OK, where's the line? What's the ethics in this? Do, should we have a discussion about this, maybe? Probably. You know, should there be a little bit more thought involved? Probably. But you know what? The next generation of mini Dans and mini Halvars and all those folks, they're growing up. And they're seeing their idols in this community doing this, and they think it's acceptable. Okay? Whether it is or not, I'm not going to debate. But it fundamentally changes the landscape of full disclosure. OK? The, the, what it used to be was, what disclosure method should I, I employ? You know, now it's, should I disclose or should I make money on it? Maybe there's even gradients in there. But there's a whole new area opened up in the full disclosure world, and its impact we don't understand yet. So we might have lost track of something. Okay, that, My point of this is not to rail on these companies, but it's the fact that ultimately we're trying to make live systems more resilient to attack. Right? Definition of computer security. It's not to make us all rich. It's to make the systems more secure. Just creating a secondary market as a clearinghouse for vulnerabilities actually make the end user more secure. Can anyone tell me yes or no? Yes or no? <laughs> and that was the best I could hope for. Um, we are potentially putting our entire livelihood at risk by running around like cowboys right now. We haven't thought this through, and we need to. So where does that leave us? One, the landscape has changed, right? At least that's my understanding. I, I don't, when I walk the halls and when I read what's going on in the popular press, I don't see the recognition 
of things having changed. It looks like just more sophisticated products and more sophisticated attacks. I think the ground rules have changed, and we need to understand that. Uh, I think we need to make vendors and the product manufacturers make products that are more secure, period. Trusted computing, things of that nature. Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah, this, you're supposed to applaud now or something. Uh, throw money, body parts, underwear. Um, we need to create a formal body of knowledge for information security, and we need to hold each other accountable, right? I said some pretty inflammatory things today. I had three people challenge me. You all should have said something. Every last one of you should have said bullshit at some point during this talk. Bullshit. There you go. Okay, you redeemed yourself. Congratulations. Um, or shit, there we go. We get some creativity there, sir. Excellent. Um, we need to think about these things, okay? You need to spend some serious thought. What are you doing with your career? What are you trying to do with your little pet project? What are you doing with your little hacking group? You know, we do it in the Schmoo group, constantly debate. What are we trying to get done? What's going on in the industry, okay? It's not just about who's got what product and how cool the newest release of VMware is, right? It's about how is this stuff changing the landscape of what we do? So, real quick, um, ShmooCon, uh, past and future. Uh, ShmooCon 3, how many people here went to ShmooCon 3? Woo! Yeah, so it's in D.C. For those that don't know, we're going to have it probably February 15th. Uh, that seems to be the relatively solid date. Um, at same venue, Warburton Park Marriott in uh, D.C. We had about 1,000 people show up last year. 1,000 people left, which was good, although um, one unnamed goon uh, inadvertently tried to sleep in the wrong hotel. Um, he was pretty drunk, <laughs> went to the wrong hotel. After talking with hotel security, he realized he wasn't in, staying at the Omni. He was staying at the Wardman, but he was in the Omni, uh, which is why his key wasn't working and other things. Um, <laughs> we did something creative. We kind of thought about training, but what we decided to do instead is turn the labs into like an open source lab development kind of thing where 30 people came and participated, kind of like they used to set up the NetWorld, uh, Networld Interop uh, network. We did the same thing at ShmooCon. It was very successful. We'll probably do that again as well. We raised a lot of money for EFF. Uh, for the one laptop per child. We had a great panel discussion, got some awareness on that. Overall, it was a blast. Hopefully, it'll continue to be so in the future. Also, we'll have some more Shmoo announcements. I was hoping to have them ready for the, today, but we don't have them ready yet, so stay tuned and all that. But anyway, he's coming up to kick me off, so thank you very much.